Hey friends, and welcome to week 10 of our journey toward hope. Uh, happy Lent to those of you who are observing this fasting season. And for those of you who might not have grown up um, observing Lent, like myself, um, and you want to know a little bit more about it, just the brief history, um, it is uh, something that was established by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And uh, it is a period of time of about 40 days from Ash Wednesday leading up to Easter, excluding Sundays, because Sundays you're already supposed to be um, fasting and kind of abstaining from things. Um, but it's a period of time to kind of prepare your heart and your spirit um, to truly reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made and the joyous gift that he is uh, of our salvation. And so uh, typically people choose something to give up during this uh, season, and they choose to um, focus more on God through that, that craving of whatever it is they gave up. Um, it's just a way of them um, kind of realigning their heart. Um, it's a symbolic of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. And we are basically putting ourselves in a hard situation and remembering um, the sacrifice that Jesus made um, to connect uh, that relationship between us and him to restore it, to make it better. Um, and the goal of this season is to reestablish that connection, reestablish our dependence on him. Um, and so it is that idea of seasons that I want us to look at, at today's story. Um, we're going to be looking in Genesis 37 and 39 uh, of the beginning of Joseph's story. Um, but that's how I want us to kind of look at it is this idea of seasons and how we kind of ebb and flow in and out of these good seasons and hard seasons and exactly what we need to be doing. Last week we talked about Jacob and him returning home and seeking reconciliation with his brother, wrestling with God and begging for God's blessing as he returned home. And of course God did. He blessed him, made him walk away with a limp, but he changed his name to symbolize this growth from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, the one that is committed to God. And uh, it is that name, Israel, that his family would carry forward on into the rest of history. God's people would be known as the Israelites. And it is Jacob's sons that we look at beginning here in Genesis 37. Most importantly, his favorite son, Joseph. Um, so uh, we're going to cover a lot. Um, what we're going to cover today is in two separate chapters, Genesis 37 and 39. Um, and so I'm going to kind of give a summary as opposed to reading all of it. Um, it is a fantastic story. I encourage you to read it on your own. But it starts with Joseph um, being <laughs> his father's favorite son. Israel loved Joseph more than the rest of his sons. It says in scripture that he was uh, given to him in his old age. We also know that he was the oldest son of <laughs> Israel's favorite wife, Rachel. Um, Rachel being the one that Israel wanted to marry to begin with and then got tricked into marrying her sister. And so we can kind of read between the lines a little bit here. And that is why Israel has the love for Joseph that he has. Um, but unfortunately, any of us who have kids know um, you can't have favorites. <laughs> it causes trouble. Um, but Israel has a favorite and he symbolizes this by giving a Joseph a special ornate coat. A coat of many colors as it's described. And Joseph becomes his father's informant about his brothers and about um, their goings on and taking care of the flocks and this type of thing. Um, he was a bit of a, a, a snitch. <laughs> he would report back to his dad about what his brothers were doing, um, whether they were doing a good job or not. And it even says at the beginning uh, of the chapter 37 that he reports back, or he gives a negative report back. Um, and so obviously his brothers are not too keen. Uh, well, unfortunately, this leads to God blessing Joseph with a couple dreams. And in these dreams, Joseph envisions um, really his family in symbolic means bowing down to him, him being the leader, basically. Um, and in, if you haven't caught on, there's this, um, there's this story of birthright, of the firstborn not getting their birthright over and over and over again throughout Scripture that God picks he who he wants to use, um, who he wants to show the most transformation through, whoever he wants to revitalize, what, however he wants to tell the story in his most creative way. And Joseph, not being the firstborn, being the firstborn of 
a certain wife, but not the firstborn in the family. That would have been Reuben uh, of the 12 brothers. Um, this would have definitely thrown a big kink into everybody else's opinion. Um, but his brothers respond poorly uh, to his snitching on them and then him also dreaming about them bowing down to him. And so they plot to kill him. Um, and so as he comes out to check on them uh, one day, they seize him and they throw him into a cistern and they take the <clears throat> into a cistern and they take his, his coat um, and they plot to kill him. And Reuben, being the oldest, talks them out of it and convinces them instead of killing him, let's sell him into slavery. Um, so they do. They sell him to some Ishmaelites who take him down to Egypt and sell him. And they uh, cover his coat in goat's blood and they tear it and they present it to their father and basically say, oh, your, your favorite son, he's gone. Um, and this is devastating to Israel. Israel says he will mourn the rest of his life or until he return or until he is reunited with Joseph, which at this point he thinks will be in heaven. Well, Joseph makes it down to Egypt and he is purchased by Potiphar, who is the chief of the guards for Pharaoh. And Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of his whole house. He sees him as dependable um, and puts everything under his care. And everything seems to be going good, in good terms, as a slave for Joseph. Until, Joseph, until Potiphar's wife attempts to seduce Joseph um, because he was a handsome young man. Um, and Joseph runs away. He flees from her. But because of his rejection, Potiphar's wife accuses him of attacking her. Um, which gets him into even more trouble. When Potiphar finally catches up with him, he throws him in jail. Well, in jail, Joseph proves himself again dependable, and the warden begins to put him in charge of things there within the jail. And Joseph's entrusted with pretty much all the affairs in the prison, so much so that the final words of chapter 39 say that the warden didn't even think about the things that he gave to Joseph because he knew that God was with him uh, and that he would accomplish whatever he set out to do. Three times in chapter 39, um, it is said that the Lord was with Joseph. In what most of us would call the uh, most difficult times of Joseph's life, both as a slave to Potiphar and then in prison in Egypt, God was with Joseph. Jo Joseph focused on and trusted in God through these seasons. Um, and that models for us the living hope that we've been searching for these past 10 weeks. Joseph undoubtedly felt God's presence because of his dreams, but the response from the people around him had been less than supportive, right? Often in this life, when we face our most challenging times, we can find ourselves feeling alone, like we're on an island. This is when our faith is truly tested. We seek to confirm our Savior's true love for us, and we find the hope for our future that God holds. As we move toward the Easter season, it's healthy for us to sit in the shadow of the cross, as one of my Lent devotionals uh, said earlier this week. It puts into perspective several things, but two very specific things. It puts into perspective when we sit in the shadow of the cross, our weakness exactly how flawed and imperfect and how in need we are, how vulnerable we can be, just like Joseph being taken advantage of and sold into slavery and thrown into prison. And granted, he was prideful <laughs> about the, the dreams that God gave him, but in the end, he was attacked by the people around him because of those things. He was not attacking anyone. And so we can be put into predicaments, sometimes by our own choosing and our own mistakes, and sometimes by the choices of the people around us. But we, when we reflect on our fallen nature and we realize exactly how broken we are and how much we need God, it humbles us. It puts us in a good place to hear from God, to learn from Him. It opens us up to the truth of Scripture into the hope that we can find in trusting in God instead of trusting in ourselves. The other thing it puts into perspective when we sit in the shadow of the cross is exactly who God is in his perfection and in his love, that he genuinely cares for us in a way that no one here on earth really can care for us. 
He loves us so completely that he was willing to give himself fully on the cross. He was willing to give himself to take our punishment on himself, which is the essence of the Easter season, realizing that the God of the universe loves us enough to take our burden, our punishment, our sin on himself and provide for us freedom in a way that no one can, that we can't even for ourselves. And so putting those two things into perspective, realizing our weakness, humbling ourselves, and realizing God's perfection and his love and elevating him to the level of God and not just a mystical genie that fulfills promises to us, but instead is the creator of everything and knows what is best for us, that we can trust him and follow him and where we trust and follow him to will produce the best results in our life. All of that wrapped up together brings me back to the very first verses we looked at on our journey toward hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. I wanted to read those again just as a reflection of Joseph's journey up to this point. They read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Joseph's story highlights for us how we should see our seasons of struggle. Joseph chose not to let the situation shake his relationship with God. He could have very easily looked at being in prison or enslaved and going, Why, God, why, why do I have to put up with this? But instead, he stayed faithful and focused on God's plan and his promise. As we'll see next week, a lot can happen if we choose to stay focused on God and his promises instead of the brokenness of the world around us. Will you pray with me? God, we we humbly come before you and we sit in the shadow of your cross as we approach the Easter season, as we approach a time of reflecting on your sacrifice and your victory over death and over sin. God, I pray that you would help us to um, take some time (laughs) in the safety of your embrace and reflect on the things in our life that we need to root out. Some things that maybe have taken an unhealthy place, they are taking your place maybe even. They've become false idols, they've become distractions. And I pray that we would be able to honestly look at them and realize the unhealthy place they've become and remove them from that place. God, I pray that we would restore you to the throne of our life, that we would see you for who you truly are in your perfection and your love. And just as Joseph clung to you and the promises that you had made to him, I pray that we would cling to you as well as we face our own enslavement at times and our own prisons that sometimes are our own making, that you would be the king of our life even in those predicaments that we would live in a way that brings honor and glory to you and that those who may be over us in those situations would look at us and see us so differently. And that difference would be because we're trusting and following you for a living hope. God, we love you, we praise you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all so much for watching this week. Hope you'll join us next week for the rest of Joseph's story. As we approach the Easter season, uh, we're going to be examining or pursuing um, what Passover is and how that connects to the Easter story. And those two things are very closely connected. Um, God has woven a beautiful story for us that oftentimes loops back around on itself um, to have uh, mirror imaged events that happen both in the Old Testament and the New Testament pointing us to what it means to truly follow him. So I hope you'll stay tuned for the next couple weeks. Love you guys. Happy Lent. And uh, we'll see you next week.